Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad, good to see everyone today in our uh, regular environmental health seminar series. I'm Ellen Hahn and I'm the director of UK CARES. And I just want to say that the talk today is consistent with one of our major science themes at UK CARES and that is the health impact of airborne contaminants. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague and friend, Erin Haynes, who's the deputy director of UK CARES and she will introduce our esteemed speaker. Awesome, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, I'm Erin Haynes, and I am very excited today to introduce you to Dr. Patrick Ryan. Um, he comes to us from our one of our neighboring sister institutions um, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati. He received his master's in epidemiology, followed by his uh, doctorate, PhD, um, in biostatistics and epidemiology um, at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and we've worked together, Pat and I, over the years, um, looking at air pollution and child effects. And uh, right now we're working on an R21, he's leading it, um, looking at the report back on how do you communicate results. So not only is he an amazing scientist and epidemiologist, but he's also very concerned about uh, communicating results and um, being responsive to his participants. So without further ado, I'm looking forward to hearing his talk on the exposure to air pollution and its impact on mental health of children. Welcome, Pat. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We're sounding good? All right. Yes. So uh, thanks for the invitation to, well, be here virtually, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, can't be there in person yet, uh, but uh, I'm happy to talk uh, today a little bit about some of the work we're doing in Cincinnati on uh, air pollution and uh, childhood mental health. Um, so I think I'm going to try to cover a, a whole bunch in, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, talk a little bit about air pollution in the brain, uh, focusing a lot on a, a cohort study that I've been a part of and leading for a number of years now called the Cincinnati Childhood Allergy and Air Pollution Study or the CAPS cohort. Talk a little bit about um, you know, the cohort itself, how we model air pollution, uh, and then some of our recent work on mental health outcomes in the cohort. Uh, and then I wanna talk a little bit about short-term exposure to air pollution and mental health in kids. And then hopefully, uh, if there's some time at the end, talk a little bit about another complementary study that we're doing looking at personal exposure to ultrafine particles and Aaron alluded to uh, some of the work we're doing there reporting back the individual um, study results from the personal monitor. So hopefully I can get to all of that in the next 50 minutes or so. So I always like to start with a, a little bit of a reminder about air pollution and, and what a ubiquitous um, and significant environmental exposure it is in the United States and worldwide. Uh, I mean, everybody breathes uh, some amount of air pollution every day. <clears throat> And worldwide, uh, at least in 2015, uh, in this Lancet um, survey, they, they estimated that ambient PM 2.5 particulate matter less than two and a half microns in diameter was the fifth ranking mortality risk factor uh, worldwide with more than 4 million deaths attributable to PM 2.5 exposure and 100 million, year, 100 million disability adjusted life years uh, lost. But if you think about you know, the, the outcomes that they look at in these types of studies are, are uh, quite bad mortality, uh, morbidity mortality outcomes uh, related to ischemic heart disease, uh, lung cancer, COPD, lower respiratory infections. The things that we are researching uh, in Cincinnati and elsewhere, things like asthma attacks, the burden of um, uh, asthma attacks in kids or mental health outcomes or preterm births, those, those types of outcomes aren't, aren't even captured in, in those estimates of, of, of air pollution exposure. So, you know, the burden I would argue is, is, is even higher than some of these estimates uh, come in at. <clears throat> so I wanted to, to talk today more on the um, mental health and the, uh, the effects of air pollution on the central nervous system. We've done a lot of work in the respiratory world uh, and I think that um, we're still doing, doing, doing a lot of research in allergic disease and asthma development in, in these kids. But I wanted to focus today more on, on some of the effects we've been seeing in, in the central nervous system. We've been studying now for a number of years, um, PM 2.5 and, and in particular traffic related air pollution. So these are the pollutants that come from uh, the burning of gasoline or uh, diesel fuel. And when you burn diesel and gasoline fuel, it produces a whole number, a whole lot of, uh, of uh, different air pollutants, including elemental carbon and, and ultrafine particles. So these are particles that are less than 100 nanometers in diameter. And because those particles are so small, they can actually be uh, directly 
uh, absorbed into the brain through the olfactory bulb or even translocate into the circulatory system and, and impact uh, peripheral uh, organs, including the heart and, and the brain. And so there's this direct mechanism by which some of these uh, particles can be uh, directly exposed to the brain, bringing with them some of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, and metals that attach to their surface. Um, there's also some, uh, some indirect mechanisms. Um, you know, the body doesn't like to be exposed to environmental exposures, uh, and air pollution is no different. It typically has some sort of inflammatory response um, that we also see in the brain. So in the late 2000s, uh, a lot of toxicologic data started to emerge, looking at neuroinflammatory effects um, with uh, air pollution exposure. So seeing things like increased microglial activation in the brain or neuroinflammatory markers upregulating in the brain after exposure to air pollution. And we know um, from a number of environmental exposures, lead being a classic example, that when you're exposed to these neurotoxicants during uh, periods of brain growth and development, the outcomes can manifest themselves years later. Uh, and so we're really interested in, in looking at uh, early childhood exposures, prenatal exposures, uh, as the brain grows and develops and, and some of the uh, outcomes later in life. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the tox data started to come out in the mid to late 2000s, suggesting that air pollution might have some central nervous system effects. And the epidemiology started to uh, follow immediately afterwards. And at this point, there's been a number of studies that have looked at uh, different domains of neuropsychological development, including psychomotor skills, cognition, which is probably the most uh, well-studied outcome with air pollution exposure, um, and, and a number of, of epidemiology studies in the United States and worldwide now show that air pollution exposure can uh, negatively impact psychomotor skills, decrease uh, cognition, again, typically uh, IQ scores lower uh, associated with, with increased air pollution exposure, um, poorer executive function, uh, worse decision-making in kids who are exposed to air pollution. A number of reports looking at autism spectrum disorder uh, associated with traffic-related air pollution exposure early in life. Relatively speaking, um, there's been much fewer uh, studies looking at social and emotional development. So things like uh, the mental health of kids who are exposed to air pollution exposure. And that's what I'm gonna focus uh, primarily on uh, in my talk today, internalizing disorders, things like anxiety and depression um, in relationship to, to air pollution exposure early in life. So I mentioned we have um, a, a cohort study that's been ongoing now for uh, almost 20 years, the Cincinnati Childhood Allergy and Air Pollution Study. And, and the original objective of this cohort was to look at kids and determine if children who are exposed to traffic-related air pollution, and, and again, specifically, we were interested in the diesel exhaust particle fraction of that uh, mixture, are at an increased risk for uh, initially allergic uh, disease and asthma development and also adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. So this is a, uh, a classic longitudinal birth cohort study. We recruited infants uh, based on their birth record addresses, and we recruited kids who uh, lived either less than 400 meters from a major road, so kids we thought were uh, exposed to air pollution early in their life, prenatally and early in life. And then we had our control group or, or kids we thought were unexposed, or at least relatively unexposed to air pollution. And those are the kids that live more than 1,500 meters from a major road. And so we recruited them uh, shortly after birth based on the birth record addresses from 2001 to 2003 and have been following them longitudinally ever since. Uh, and we are currently uh, seeing them as part of, uh, if you've heard of the NIH ECHO program, we are one of the 80-some uh, ECHO cohorts. Uh, and so we're seeing them uh, still now as they're entering um, adult, young adulthood. They're uh, turning 18, 19 years old. So early in life, uh, we saw them at ages one, two, three, and four, again, primarily focused on allergic disease outcomes. Uh, we did questionnaires, we did allergy testing, we collected biospecimens, uh, DNA, and, and did spirometry when they were uh, seven years old. Uh, we also have some uh, home uh, walkthrough data. We collected dust, we did mold assessments, and, and so forth uh, early in their life. Uh, we saw them again at age seven, where we uh, did the same type of assessments uh, in addition to uh, uh, our first neuro assessment using the BASC, and I'll talk a little bit more about the BASC here in a second. We saw them at age 12, and at age 12, we, we primarily focused on, on the neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so, oops, 
I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, I'm so grateful for the, the participants in this study. They've been in, you know, for more, almost two decades at this point. And um, some of these study visits are quite intensive. So this is the outcome assessment that we did at age 12, focusing on uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. This is in addition to the allergic disease outcomes that we still assessed, so lung function and, and questionnaires. We did child direct assessments looking at uh, IQ. We did uh, measures of depression and anxiety. We did a, a grooved pegboard uh, which test, which is a measure of fine motor skills. Um, we looked at reading comprehension and sentence comprehension. We did caregiver assessments. So the parents uh, themselves came in and, and uh, assessed their child's behavior and emotional functioning, um, sleep uh, problems, executive functioning, um, and uh, autism-like behaviors with the social uh, responsiveness scale. And we also measured uh, in the caregivers themselves uh, a measure of IQ and, and depression. And I'm going to share with you some of the results uh, of those assessments, as well as our uh, nested MRI study, um, which we had about 150 participants uh, take part in, um, where we looked at both structural and functional uh, uh, structural and functional uh, characteristics of, of the brain um, when they were 12 years old. So it was quite an intensive uh, outcome assessment when they were 12, looking at neurodevelopmental uh, outcomes uh, throughout childhood. <clears throat> The other component of, of the study is, is the exposure assessment. And I'm gonna talk a, a bit about this because this is where uh, a lot of my own research uh, resides in how we, um, how we measure air pollution, how we model air pollution, and, and lately how we uh, use new monitors and personal monitors to measure air pollution. So in the CAP study, uh, we started with an air sampling campaign that uh, took place from 2001 to 2006. Uh, we had 27 sampling sites set up throughout the Cincinnati area, uh, and we measured PM 2.5 and elemental carbon. And I, again, we're, we're very interested in, in um, the diesel exhaust component of the uh, uh, air pollution mixture. And so we really narrowed in and focused on uh, the elemental carbon that's in PM 2.5 because uh, diesel is, is a significant uh, contributor. Diesel exhaust particles are a significant contributor to that elemental carbon fraction. And so we focused on elemental carbon that was attributable to traffic sources. We measured that at all of these sampling sites, these 27 sampling sites over this five years of, of air sampling early in the child's life. And we developed uh, initially something called a land use regression model. And this is, uh, at the time it was, was somewhat uh, novel. Um, this technique is now uh, pretty standard in, in studies of intra-urban air pollution exposure. Uh, but the, the basic idea behind a uh, land use regression model is you take the air sampling data that you've collected at your sampling sites and you look at the surrounding land use and geographic uh, characteristics that might predict um, the uh, concentrations of the air pollution you've measured at that sampling site. So, for example, in our land use regression model, if we look at uh, or we, we measure the, uh, the number of trucks that pass within 400 meters of our sampling site, the elevation of our sampling site, the bus route, routes around our sampling site, uh, and other geographic predictors, we can, we can get an R-square value of about 0.75. So about 75% of the variability in our uh, measured air pollution values, uh, we can model with our land use regression model. <clears throat> and so Hopefully you can see my pointer. If you, if you look at the, the, the map on the left, you can see the stars indicate the sampling sites that we had in Cincinnati. The blue purple dots here are the actual home addresses of our study participants uh, at birth. The middle figure is a, 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 a representation of what the estimated air pollution levels, uh, the elemental carbon levels uh, are in the Cincinnati area. After we uh, develop our land use regression model, you can see the highest estimated levels if you're familiar with Cincinnati. This is downtown Cincinnati. This is I-75. And so the highest estimated levels are in the close proximity to the major roads uh, in Cincinnati. And if we apply that model then to the homes of our kids in the study, uh, we get a picture like this, where the larger red dots are the estimated, higher estimated um, uh, ECAD exposures, elemental carbon exposures, and the, low, the smaller yellow dots uh, indicate the uh, lower estimated uh, ECAD exposures in our cohort. So um, going from air sampling data to a model, to applying the model to our, to our study cohort, so we can start to look at some of our health effects. And we've used this model again on 
uh, our uh, respiratory outcomes, asthma development in childhood, wheezing outcomes, um, and those, those types of uh, uh, allergic disease outcomes. Um, but we've also now looked at it with some of our mental health outcomes. The nice thing about this, this model is that we can start to delineate specific time periods. So in this figure I'm showing is the birth record address uh, of the kids in our, in our cohort, but we collect the address histories as they, as they grow. So as they move, um, we re-estimate their air pollution exposures based upon uh, their current addresses throughout childhood. And so we can start to look at different time periods of, of growth and development. Um, and I'm gonna show you uh, just a couple of time periods we've looked at early life, which we usually use the birth record address to estimate the exposure. Uh, we look at the current exposure. So in, in the data I'm gonna show you is, eight, is collected at age 12. So we look at um, the ECAT, the elemental carbon exposure in the uh, year prior to age 12. And then we can look at it throughout childhood. So an average childhood exposure. So that's, that's the cohort. Um, that's just a real brief overview of how we estimate our uh, air pollution in, in our cohort, in the, in the CAPS cohort. Um, and I wanted to, to focus on some of the recent results we've had on, on mental health. So if you look at the literature, um, there's, there's a decent amount um, of evidence that air pollution is associated with mental health outcomes in adults. So for example, increased risk for uh, suicide, increased risk for uh, emergency department visits for depression and anxiety in adults. Um, but we know that typically the first onset of, of anxiety and depression is in, in childhood or adolescence. Uh, and we know it's quite a big problem. So more than a third of uh, children are, are uh, diagnosed with a major depression disorder um, and, and anxiety, uh, the prevalence of anxiety in kids is, is over 40%. So these are, these are major um, disorders, uh, problems in, in children and adolescents. We know that they're difficult to detect, they're undertreated, uh, and they have lifelong implications. So substance abuse, suicide risk, unemployment, all are associated with uh, the onset of, of depression and anxiety in childhood and um, adolescence. So <clears throat> one of the first things we, we wanted to look at when it comes to the mental health outcomes was um, uh, the association of early childhood and, and, and average childhood exposure with uh, depression and anxiety by the time they were at age 12. And if uh, going back to the assessment, we have both parent report of depression and anxiety and child report of depression and anxiety. Um, the parent report comes from the Behavioral Assessment System for Children or the BASC-2. Uh, it has multiple subscales. It's normed, population normed, um, and here we're looking at the depression and anxiety subscales. The mean is 50, the standard deviation is 10 in the, in the norms. Um, the higher the score is uh, the more problems um, that the parent is reporting for their child. Um, in the child, we, actually, we asked the child to, re, um, to complete the child depression inventory short form or the CDI2 and the Spence children's anxiety scale. Uh, again, these are population norm with a mean 50, standard deviation of 10. And the higher the score, um, the more, the more um, depression and anxiety that the, that, that the, uh, the child is, is uh, reporting. So a couple of things uh, to note here. So if we look at the parent report from the BASC, uh, in general, it looks uh, relatively normal. The depression, the mean uh, report was 49.9, standard deviation of 10, slightly higher scores in the parent report of anxiety and a little more variability. Um, interestingly, if you go over to what the kids are telling us, uh, it's somewhat reversed. So the kids are reporting more depression than their, their parents are uh, reporting. Um, still relatively normal, the mean was 52.7, um, but less anxiety. So the parents tend to uh, over-report their child's anxiety uh, compared to what the, the children are reporting. Um, and the other thing to note here is there's not great correlation between what the parents are telling us and what the children are reporting themselves. And so I think that's important. And it's um, something we've thought a bit about uh, in our analyses. Um, by definition, these are internalizing behaviors. Um, so it's often tough to recognize um, when your uh, child is, is uh, exhibiting depression or anxiety. Um, and so we looked at both of these outcomes. Um, the analysis was a, a linear regression model. We adjusted for a number of covariates. Uh, we looked at exposure at those various time points, early childhood, throughout childhood, and the current exposures. Um, and this is what we saw. 
Uh, first, we saw no significant associations between uh, air pollution exposure at any time in the child's life and the parent reported uh, depression and anxiety from the BASC too. However, if we look at what the kids are telling us, we saw a number of significant associations. Um, the first is uh, early exposure to air pollution significantly associated with the child reported uh, depression. So you can see here, um, this is a, a parameter estimate for the interquartile range in our exposure. Uh, and we saw a three point increase in the child depression inventory scale um, with, with that uh, 0.25 microgram per cubic meter increase in exposure. So a significant association, higher depression uh, associated with higher uh, early childhood exposure to air pollution. We also saw childhood and current exposure is significantly associated with generalized anxiety and social phobias. So um, in, in these outcomes, we saw at multiple time points throughout their life, and it's relatively consistent across the subscales, uh, though not all of them are statistically significant. And you can see here, uh, we adjusted in these models for uh, maternal age of delivery, household income, uh, mom's own depression, um, the relationship, the parent relationship with their child, uh, race and tobacco smoke exposure. So we thought um, that's interesting. Uh, it was, I think, one of the first, if not the first reports of uh, an internalizing disorder uh, associated with early childhood air pollution exposure. Um, and we wanted to look at um, some of the, the, the mechanistic underlying pathways that might be leading to these outcomes in our kids with our MRI data. So one of the first things we did was uh, look at the magnetic resonance spectroscopy data that we have. Uh, from the MRI. So this gives us some insight into brain metabolism, um, and it measures uh, uh, ongoing metabolite levels in the brain uh, at the time of the MRI. And what we did was a mediation analysis. So we saw the relationship between air pollution and anxiety at age 12, and we wanted to see uh, or look and, and investigate whether some of that uh, relationship was mediated through these metabolites uh, in the brain. So a little bit more about the MRI substudy that we had. Um, we had 145 kids participate in this, and we recruited them to participate in the MRI um, based upon their early childhood exposure. So these are kids that uh, either had very high exposures because they lived near the major roadways at birth or low exposures. So we really wanted to look at the extremes in our, in our subscale. Um, the spectroscopy data comes from the uh, anterior cingulate cortex of the brain. Um, and we chose this uh, because it has connections to both the emotional and the cognitive uh, regions. And so we thought this was a, an interesting place to look um, when we started the MRI study. And again, um, this is a, a mediation analysis that I'm going to show you. So we're looking at the direct and indirect effects um, from, of air pollution on uh, anxiety uh, T-scores. So the first... The first part of the mediation analysis looked at uh, this link between air pollution exposure and the metabolite levels of the brain. Um, we did not see any uh, evidence that early life exposures were associated with these brain metabolite levels, but that makes some sense because these are current levels. Um, if we look at the current estimated exposures to air pollution, uh, we did see two metabolites that were significantly associated. Uh, glutathione, which is an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant uh, um, uh, metabolite, uh, and myanositol. And then if we look at the other side of, of this uh, mediation analysis, the link between the metabolite levels and the anxiety symptom T-scores, um, we saw a uh, significant association uh, between uh, myanositol levels uh, and our generalized anxiety T-scores uh, um, at age 12. And you can see here, this is the raw data, and that's a pretty strong linear association between increased um, myonositol levels in the brain and anxiety T-scores. Um, and when we put it all together in the mediation analysis, uh, we estimate about 20% of our um, the total effect of ECAT exposure um, on anxiety is mediated through this myonositol um, uh, metabolite levels in, in the brain. And, you know, myonositol is an interesting uh, brain metabolite. It's important for a, a number of brain processes. It's been uh, observed to be increased in a number of uh, diseases uh, in, and also linked to brain inflammation. Um, it's it's uh, uh, associated with microglial activation, 
um, and it's a transient um, uh, metabolite. So it makes some sense that uh, current levels of air pollution exposure are associated with those increased myonositol levels. And so what we're hypothesizing, in, at least from this data, is that um, you know, the traffic-related air pollution or maybe some constituents uh, within the traffic-related air pollution are actually deposited into this uh, uh, anterior cingulate cortex region of the brain, resulting in some neuroinflammation uh, and increased myonositol levels uh, that then manifest itself in, in some of these anxiety symptoms that we, we've observed in our cohort. The other thing, uh, the other the MRI data that we've, we've been able to analyze at this point is um, so looking at some air pollution and brain structure. Um, a, a 2019 review that did not include our study, it was, it was published before our study, um, found six, six other studies that looked at uh, brain structure in childhood related to uh, trepidated air pollution. So this is a relatively new area of research. Um, so we wanted to, again, look at these uh, measures of brain structure in our cohort. Um, for this outcome, we had 135 participants um, that had our MRI data suitable for analysis. Um, the majority of those had high uh, ECAT exposure and 59 had, had low ECAT exposure early in life. Um, and we saw a couple of things. First, we saw um, uh, reduced cortical thickness um, in the bilateral medial region uh, of the posterior front uh, lobes that was associated with ECAT exposure. Uh, and this is an area that's associated with uh, sensory regions um, and voluntary movements. We saw reduced gray matter volumes in the cerebellum, um, and those are uh, involved with regulating motor function and cognition. And if you put those two findings together, um, we are thinking that um, the combination of reduced cortical thickness and, and uh, cerebellar volume suggests that uh, TRAP might actually impair some motor function. And so we're looking now at the group pegboard results um, from our uh, age 12 visit to see if we see a link between higher levels of air pollution exposure um, and impaired uh, fine motor skills in our kids. And so that's, that's an analysis that we're working on uh, currently. So I've, I've quickly ran through uh, a number of, of um, outcomes and results looking at long-term childhood exposures um, to chronic outcomes. So anxiety and depression that's been measured at age 12 uh, in our cohort in relationship to early and chronic exposures to air pollution. Um, but we also wanted to, to look and see if, if short-term acute exposures to air pollution might lead to an exacerbation of existing mental uh, health problems or disorders in, in kids. And again, that's been observed in adults. Uh, it hadn't been observed in kids, uh, but in adults, the exacerbations of uh, psychiatric disorders have been linked to inflammation and, and microglia activation again, um, and a, some evidence of, of uh, attempted suicides and increased emergency department visits for um, depression in adults. Uh, associated with, with short-term exposures to PM 2.5. Um, and so in the analysis that I'm going to share with you next, we wanted to look at the relationship between short-term exposures now to PM 2.5 uh, and the risk for pediatric psychiatric emergency department visits. And we have um, in Cincinnati, um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital is actually the um, the, the, the majority, I would say 90% plus of um, Pediatric emergency department visits actually come through Cincinnati Children's Hospital or one of its satellite locations. And so it's almost a population-based sample. Uh, and what we did was, was um, uh, design a time-stratified case crossover study to look at um, time periods of air pollution exposure, elevated air pollution exposure uh, in relationship to um, emergency department visits for, for specific ICD-10 codes uh, for psychiatric uh, reasons. So I'll talk a little bit about the um, time stratified case crossover study design if, if, uh, if, if uh, some folks are not uh, as familiar with this study design. Um, but essentially it uses uh, cases as their own controls. Uh, and I'll tell you what that means. But the cases are defined um, by the date of the emergency department visit. We collected all emergency department visits from 2011 through 2015 again, for psychiatric uh, codes. Uh, we extracted the date and the home address from the electronic health records 
and then geocoded those addresses so we could estimate exposure. So a little bit more about the time stratified case crossover um, design. This is a, a study design that's used uh, frequently in air pollution um, research uh, because it's appropriate to look at uh, the short-term effects of transient exposures. So it's, it's appropriate for um, outcomes that are uh, occur that, that, that occur transiently. So they, they elevate and then they go down. So asthma um, uh, exacerbations are a, a good example. Um, so here we're looking at emergency department visits for an exacerbation of a psychiatric disorder. Um, and then the other element of this is, is you need the exposures to be transient. So the exposures go up and down also. Uh, and so again, it's appropriate for air pollution because air pollution levels change uh, day to day and, and location to location. Um, the, the real advantage to this type of study design is because every case serves as their own control. Um, it really removes the confounding for things that don't change uh, uh, over time. So for example, genetics is a, a good example. Uh, every case is their own control in this study design. Uh, and so a person's genetics isn't going to change. And so you don't have to worry about the effect of genetics on, on the outcome. Um, so the way this works, uh, I have here. So in our example, the case uh, of, of uh, psychiatric emergency department visits was extracted from the electronic health records. You get the admission date and the address. And what we do is we estimate the PM 2.5 exposure for that person at their address on the day of their visit and then in the days before their visit. And then for that exact same person, we look at uh, control periods, time periods in which they were not in the, in the emergency room for, for their um, uh, exacerbation of a psychiatric disorder. And we look at the, the, uh, um, the PM 2.5 exposure at their address, the day of that control, and then the days prior to that control. And so that's what I mean by every case serves as their own control. It's the same person, their cases when they're in the hospital, their controls when they're not in the hospital. And we want to see if the PM 2.5 values or exposure estimates are higher uh, in the day of or the days preceding when they were cases. Um, so we match the control days on the day of the week, the month, and the year, and then we do adjust for things that can change over short times, things like temperature, humidity, and, and holidays. And then you analyze it like a typical case control study. Um, the other thing that makes this, this study design possible uh, is a spatial temporal uh, model of PM 2.5 exposure that was developed by uh, Dr. Cole Brokamp at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And I, I just wanna go into a little bit of detail with this because it really makes a lot of these analyses possible. Um, what, what, what this model does, it's, it's different than the land use regression model that I talked to you about before. What we're doing in this model is taking satellite-based measures of aerosol optical de depth. So it's, it's a measure of particulate matter in the atmosphere uh, measured by satellites that pass over the region. Um, combine that data with a number of other uh, meteorological data, um, as well as land use, roadways, green space. Um, and then you calibrate all that information um, based on PM 2.5 that was sampled uh, from the United States EPA Ambient Air Quality Network. Um, and what, what it ends up doing is uh, calibrating all of this daily satellite data and meteorologic data to more than 26,000 PM 2.5 uh, measured uh, PM 2.5 at the uh, surface of, of, um, of the earth. And uh, the model performs quite well. And I'll show you, hopefully this works. Um, hopefully you can see, I don't know, I'm not sure actually, because I'm sharing my uh, screen if you can see this, but luckily I, can, I have a couple of uh, static images uh, when, when we share the uh, slides, if you click on that link, you'll actually see a movie that shows the daily estimates of PM 2.5 changing every day in the Cincinnati area. Um, but what it, what it looks like, these are just two static images from the model. And what it, what it ends up doing is estimating PM 2.5 at every one kilometer uh, resolution in Cincinnati for every day from 2000 to 2015. And what this allows you to do then is a case crossover study like we did, where we estimate PM 2.5 exposure uh, at our case's address at the day of their uh, exacerbation and then also uh, at their control days. Uh, and you can see here, where am I? Uh, 
Um, on the figure on the left is, is a, a picture of what PM 2.5 looks like in Cincinnati, uh, averaged over the entire 15 year time frame from 2000 to 2015. And the figure on the right shows you um, just one day, uh, June 18th, 2010, and what the PM 2.5 looks like uh, on that day. And so you can see that this really changes day to day. Uh, so that's the temporal variability. And it also changes across the study region. So where you live uh, and what day you were exposed really does make a difference. So if you apply that model to the uh, emergency department visit data that we extracted, uh, from two, uh, 2011 to 2015, you can see here um, the, the, um, the number of, of uh, emergency department visits was more than 13,000 in that time frame. And you can see the various uh, subcategories or reasons for those visits, the most common being uh, mood disorders, externalizing disorders, depression disorders. Um, and you can see the breakdown by age and, and gender as well. And unfortunately, I've lost my arrow. But um, here in this figure, you can see uh, the estimated associations between PM 2.5 exposure uh, and um, the risk for uh, an exacerbation of some of these psychiatric disorders. And you can see significant associations um, with all cause uh, emergency department visits for psychiatric disorders in the day prior to that uh, um, uh, visit as well as mood disorders, adjustment disorders, um, and suicidality the day before um, the visit. And then the other thing that we looked at uh, in this study is, um, you know, air pollution doesn't uh, occur in, in uh, isolation. It occurs in the context of um, your own personal stressors as well as community level stressors. Uh, and so we wanted to look at whether or not some of these associations were different depending on where you lived, so the community in which you lived. And so um, what we did was develop an index of what we call deprivation based on census level data of the uh, tracks, census tracts in which everybody lives in Cincinnati. And we looked again at, at the PM 2.5 exposures to see if they were modified um, by the neighborhood in which the, the, the kids lived in. And what we saw was, was I think, pretty interesting. We saw that uh, neighborhoods or communities with higher levels of deprivation, again, as, as measured by this index uh, of census tract variables, um, had increased risk for suicidality and anxiety. Uh, and we saw the opposite in, in um, adjustment disorders. So areas with lower community deprivation had a, uh, an increased risk for uh, adjustment disorders when you were exposed to PM 2.5. So, um, you know, some evidence that uh, not only the PM 2.5 affects uh, these outcomes, but the context, the neighborhood in which you live at uh, also seems to modify some of these associations. And we're not the only, two, uh, only group to see those types of interactions between environmental exposures uh, and community level uh, exposures. Uh, but I thought it was quite, pretty interesting with this type of outcome uh, in kids. So, um, that was a lot. I know I ran through it as quickly as possible because I wanted to leave as much time as I could to talk about this other study that we've uh, uh, going on. But just to summarize, um, we've seen exposure to air pollution during childhood that may disrupt normal brain development. Um, the data from the CAP study suggests that childhood exposure to traffic related air pollution is associated with internalizing disorders uh, in adolescence or early adolescence at age 12. And we've also seen recent uh, short-term PM 2.5 exposures associated with these acute exacerbation of mental health outcomes. And it's possible um, that some brain metabolites or inflammatory pathways are, are playing an important role in, in that um, uh, exacerbation of, of those outcomes. Um, so just where we're going with this research, um, we are still sifting through a number of the neurodevelopmental domains in the CAP study, including cognition and IQ and the fine motor skills that I mentioned. Um, we've looked at a little bit at the community level uh, exposures that I just talked about, the community deprivation, but we're also interested in things like uh, green space and so the amount of, of uh, green vegetation, parks, trees that, that surround your home and how that might impact or, or affect the relationship between air pollution and exposure. Uh, and some of these neurodevelopmental outcomes. Uh, we're interested in what noise does 
um, the effect of heat, particularly on um, some of the internalizing and, and uh, also externalizing disorders in childhood, uh, and then other chemical and non-chemical stressors. And we also have some data on, um, I talked to you about elemental carbon. We also have data on other uh, components of PM 2.5, uh, particularly the, the, the metal components, lead, for example. Uh, and so we're, we're starting to look at some of the composition of PM 2.5 and seeing if that's um, relevant for, for these neurodevelopmental outcomes. So I want to switch gears a little bit and just spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about um, uh, another study, a uh, complementary study, but a different study uh, looking at personal exposure to ultrafine particles. So um, we talked about PM 2.5. Those are particles that are two and a half microns in diameter or less. Uh, ultrafine particles uh, are defined as particles that are less than 100 nanometers in diameter or less. So in the nomenclature, it would be PM 0 0.1. So these are very small particles uh, because of their size. Um, they can uh, be deposited deep into the alveolar regions of the lungs or potentially translocate into the circulatory system or go through the olfactory bulb and affect the brain. Um, so we think they have um, uh, potentially greater toxicity um, than some of the larger particles, uh, especially for the mental health outcomes. There's both um, man-made and uh, natural sources of, of ultrafine particles, just like uh, the larger particles. Um, the most common uh, outdoor source in urban areas is traffic, and, and of that, the most common uh, is diesel exhaust particles. Um, those are, are primarily ultrafine in size. Um, compared to larger particles, PM 2.5 and PM 10, there's been very few epidemiologic studies that are focused on ultrafine particles, and I would argue that that's because it's not easy to measure these, these particles for a number of reasons. One is they don't weigh very much. So relatively speaking, um, these particles don't contribute to mass concentration. So when you measure PM 2.5 based on filter-based mass measures, um, the larger particles dominate that mass concentration, even though, and this figure is showing, um, by number concentration, by the total number of particles in the air, by far the particles are dominated by ultrafines. Um, so we really have to think about a different way of, of measuring these other than by weighing filters. Um, and the, the way that, that folks are thinking about this is counting the number of particles in a volume of air uh, or measuring the surface area of, of these particles. And the other challenge, and this is true for any air pollutant, um, personal exposure uh, frequently, I'd say often, usually exceeds monitored data. And that's because we all have personal activities that increase our exposure. We don't just sit around EPA monitoring sites. We move, we interact. I see somebody driving right now. Uh, so that person is probably being exposed to much higher levels of, of uh, air pollution and particles um, than someone who's sitting inside uh, their house. So sorry to embarrass you, but uh, it's a good example. Um, so anyway, so we have uh, uh, personal exposures that exceed uh, monitored data. Um, that make it challenging to, to measure these. And so personal monitoring is really the, um, the, the gold standard for how we would like to get at um, ultrafine particles and, 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 uh, and, and exposure. Um, so up until the last 10 years or so, the devices to measure ultrafine particles are desktop sized devices. So the size of, well, old computers. Um, so you really can't put one of those on, on your back and, and wear it around to, to measure exposure. Um, but we've been involved uh, now for about 10 years with a, um, an engineer at the University of Cincinnati who's developed a device called the PUFP, um, which stands for the Personal Ultrafine Particle Monitor. Um, that's, uh, wear it's a wearable device that can count ultrafine particles. And so we've been using that device in a number of studies. So this is just some information about this. You can see here the relative size of the device compared to a cell phone. Um, there's, it has a, a lot of nice properties, one being that uh, it can measure particles up to 200,000 particles per cc per cubic centimeter of air. Um, it's, it's relatively small, so kids can wear it. It has GPS, so you can, you can actually uh, see where you're exposed and what you're exposed to. And it runs on battery power, so you can wear it around. And this is just some example of, of data you can collect from from personal monitoring devices, this is data collected that I collected on myself, uh, measuring ultrafine particle concentrations in various environments on my commute home, when I mow the lawn, um, and my commute to work, and so on and so forth. 
So these are types of activities that you really just can't get um, and, and exposures you don't usually get when you model them um, based on, on air sampling. So we've done uh, a couple of studies um, looking at uh, uh, adolescence exposure to personal exposure to ultrafine particles. Uh, one of the first ones we did was on kids uh, with asthma that um, uh, went to school at Cincinnati Public. Um, and when we looked at their exposures and where they were, because we had the GPS data, uh, a couple of interesting things popped out. So overall, their median exposure was about 13,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Um, it was much higher, however, when they walked to and from school. So the median exposure during walking was 27,000. And I was a little surprised. I thought it would be higher if they were riding the school bus because school buses are, are diesel powered. We thought, you know, um, the ultrafine particle concentrations while riding school buses would be a little bit higher. But when we looked at the data, um, it made some sense. So most of these kids walked to and from school. Um, we had about uh, five or six that rode the school bus, but you could see the ones that walked and, and some of the interesting patterns that emerged. So um, you can see on the, the figure on the left, participant one um, lived in an area with relatively high ultrafine particle concentrations because they live near Interstate 75 in Cincinnati. Uh, and you can see the walking to and from uh, school, from school to home. Uh, participant two lived in, in a more of a suburban area. Um, but what was interesting about participant two was you can see the elevated exposures that they get every time they went to an intersection. So when they sat in an intersection where cars and trucks were idling, um, the, high, the, the levels of, of ultrafine particles were, were much, much higher. And so um, we, we took this data and, and received a, a grant to do uh, a relatively large study of personal exposure to ultrafine particles uh, in adolescence, which we call the Ecological Momentary Assessment and Personal Particle Exposure Study, so the ECOMAP study. Uh, and we've, we've integrated a number of, of personal uh, monitors and sensors into this, this study protocol. So um, we had, uh, actually we have a little bit more than 100 participants uh, enroll in the study. We asked them to wear our devices for one week um, they do something called ecological momentary assessment, which I'm not going to get too in depth, but essentially that's repeated uh, questionnaire collection uh, on their cell phones um, throughout the day. So we get um, measures of respiratory health, uh, thermal comfort, sleep, things like that uh, at multiple time points throughout the day. Um, they also do handheld spirometry throughout the day uh, and all of it tied to the, uh, the cell phones that we, we give them. Um, and then, of course, they wear a monitor as well. And this is just some data on, on who participated in this study. Uh, we actually had 118 enroll um, in, into, the, uh, into the Ecomap study. Um, and I'm, I won't go in depth in the actual exposure stuff with this because I want to, I want to talk about um, the project that, that Dr. Haynes uh, mentioned at the, uh, the beginning that, that she and I are working on now. So um, you, I've shown you some of the maps that we get from this type of data. And it, it got me thinking a couple of years ago um, you know, typically when we did the CAP study, when we monitor uh, air pollution or we model air pollution exposure, we don't, we, don't, we don't report that data back to the study participants. And there's a number, number of reasons we don't do that. There's a lot of error in these models. I talked about, you know, personal exposure exceeds um, uh, model data almost always. Um, but when we use these real-time devices that have GPS integrated into it, it really gives us um, not only an in-depth insight regarding you know, where they are, what they were doing, and, and when they were exposed, um, but I think that's useful data, right? So it's, it's fundamentally different than, than the data and the model estimates that we, we, um, we get from uh, fixed monitoring sites or modeled uh, data, uh, and it's actionable data, right? So um, from the biomonitoring world, um, I think it's similar, but I actually would, would argue that it's a little bit more informative than telling someone um, what their blood lead level is, for example, or what their uh, concentration of PFOS or, or BPA in the blood is. Um, because, you know, we can actually identify places and times um, that they were exposed to higher levels and, and potentially, you know, reduce those exposures. So we can increase awareness of their exposure. We can identify locations, we can identify times or maybe even activities um, where they had higher levels of exposure. And, and this really does give you, um, you know, the potential to inform behavioral changes to reduce exposures. And this is just uh, 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 an article that came out in, in Environmental Health Perspectives a couple of years ago uh, of one potential way of doing that, identifying 
routes for walkers and cyclists um, so that they can avoid levels of air pollution. So if we tell people, you know, you were exposed to higher levels when you walked to school this way, potentially, you know, you could walk to school at a different time, you know, earlier in the morning or a different way to school, something like that. Uh, same with adults. Maybe you're exposed during rush hour. If you leave 15 minutes earlier, you take a different route to work, you might have, have lower exposures. Um, I also want to mention, you know, there's pretty, pretty, there, there's consensus at this point that um, returning participants biomonitoring data. So when you take a blood sample for someone that's in one of your studies and you measure uh, whatever you're measuring, chemical exposures or inflammatory markers, things like that, um, that telling those individuals their study results um, is appropriate, it's ethical, um, it increases their knowledge of environmental health, it might motivate action or, or other, give other uh, benefits. But again, usually we don't turn, uh, return the exposure results from our air pollution studies um, because of those reasons I, I mentioned before. And so that's the goal of, of this new study that Dr. Haynes mentioned, this R21, um, where we're collaborating with the Ecomap participants to develop um, effective report back strategies for our personal air monitors. And so this is just an example of an information, an infographic that was uh, developed by uh, Elise Wright at the University of Kentucky, um, trying to, to tell uh, our study participants, you know, what are ultrafine particles? How do they get in your body? What are the health risks? We have an interactive uh, report back um, that we're getting feedback on now um, to show, actually give, give our study participants um, their results and a map of their results that they can zoom in and see, oh, I was here when I was exposed to higher levels or uh, you know, when I cook at home, I, I seem to be exposed to higher levels of ultrafine particles, things like that. And so it's an iterative process that we're going through in this R21, working with our study participants, working with experts in the field. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and report all of these study results back to our participants uh, and see if it doesn't increase their knowledge of, of environmental health, ultrafine particles and ways that they can reduce their exposures. So, um, you know, just to summarize, um, you know, the Ecomap data integrates multiple sensors. Um, there's challenges that go along with that, including, um, you know, data management issues, participant burden, things like that. Um, but it's really an exciting line of research. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to pursue um, personal monitors and, and uh, um, uh, you know, the, the assessing real-time outcome data uh, in our, our kids as well. Uh, and then, you know, I mentioned we, we're identifying and reducing exposures is something that I that I hope that we can pursue in the future um, with this with this data. So with that, I know that was a lot. I tried to cram into 55 minutes. Um, I, I just want to make sure I acknowledge, you know, all the um, and this is not all the the, the students and, and uh, fellows and faculty that have been involved, but some of the um, key uh, co-investigators and collaborators at University of Cincinnati at Children's Hospital, uh, as well as the uh, University of Kentucky and our funding sources, uh, NIEHS. And I'm happy to answer questions for five minutes or a little bit longer if we have, and um, if there's anything on the chat, I can, I can do that too. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pat. That was incredible uh, breadth uh, and depth of knowledge and research that you've done on air pollution. Fantastic. There are a few questions. So we have a few minutes and we'll get to them. Um, uh, Dr. Jason Unrowing, um, he says hello, number one. And then he asks if um, road air pollution um, on roadways are also, a, are, are you looking at noise, light? You did mention this a little bit. Um, but are they, do you think noise and light and other things are surrounding roads um, could be related to particles and particulates? So, so, so we know that their noise in particular is, is uh, correlated with, with a lot of the traffic related pollutant exposures. Um, I personally think that noise probably does exert some, some health effect. Um, delineating the two, especially when you're looking at models uh, are tough. And so in the um, Ecomap study, so not in CAPS, in the Ecomap study, we do have a personal noise monitor um, that they wear. And so uh, I didn't share any of the data. I have a, a, a graduate student now that's going through uh, and looking at and trying to find um, periods where they're not correlated. So where, where, are we, where are you when you're high exposed to noise and not ultrafines and vice versa? Uh, but it's an important 
point, and it's a, it's a tough one to get at, especially when you model it because they are so highly correlated. Uh, noise, noise for sure. Light pollution, the same thing. Um, okay. You know, where you live, these, these, these environmental exposures don't occur in isolation. So true. It's the mixture effect that we have to constantly right. uh, be looking at, but not just chemical mixtures, but exposure mixtures. Um, you mentioned the EcoMap study, so I'm going to jump to the, a question on that one from um, Dr. Ellen Hahn. She wants to know, did the kids in the EcoMap study, are you measuring their use of tobacco and e-cigarettes? We are. Well, when you say measuring, I would say uh, we're measuring it by questionnaire. So we are not in that study measuring uh, copenine or, or, um, or nicotine uh, as a biomarker, but we are getting questionnaires. And by questionnaire, we have very, well, we have no, no smokers, <clears throat> which um, I, you know, I might believe they're relatively young in adolescence and it's also a population. So I, I, I glossed through, we recruited those kids um, uh, from employee records at Children's Hospital. So um, I kind of glossed over the demographic data of the, of the participants, but they're relatively high SES. Um, study participants um, that come from relatively high educational backgrounds. So um, we do ask, but we don't have anybody saying that they do. Okay. Hey, Pat, this is, can I follow up real quick sure. um, on that question? Because, you know, e-cigarettes put out a lot of nanoparticles, very, very ultrafine particles in addition to regular particles. So I were, I'm worried, and it depends on how you ask the question. If you're asking, do they use tobacco? A lot of kids don't yeah. think e-cigarettes are tobacco, they are. So I just wondered if, if that's something that you might wanna think a, a little bit about. Yeah, so we, we do, we ask, and I'm not the, the expert in uh, tobacco smoke research, I'll admit, but we do ask separately um, about cigarette use and e-cigarette use, and I don't know if I'm using all the right terms, vaping and all the rest, uh, we do ask those terms separately from that. Um, we don't get, so when I say we don't get reports, none of the kids say that they report. Um, we do have, I think, seven or eight uh, caregivers that said they, either they or someone in their household smokes. And when we look at that data, those seven or eight do have higher, the kids have higher levels of exposure to ultrafine particles. Um, so, but it, it, according to the kids, none of them smoke or vape or use e-cigarettes. Well, and a related question I had that's in the chat had to do with on um, the bigger study, the CAPS, uh, I think mm -hmm. I'm saying that right, whether you monitor indoor environmental exposures um, on a, you know, yeah. ongoing basis. So on an ongoing basis, I would say we have uh, what I would call integrated measures. So we have dust. Um, and so we measure some indoor environmental exposures in the dust, primarily related to allergens, endotoxin, uh, mold. We're doing some microbiome work. Um, so um, we have those types of measures uh, from the dust, but uh, we don't have chemical. So one of the things we don't have at this point in CAPS is, is chemical exposures, um, but we're starting to get some of those. So we do collect urine and blood. Uh, we have hair. Um, and so we're starting to get some of those. Uh, we do have some metal exposures and I know Jason Nunrin's on this call and he's done some um, metal exposures in uh, uh, toenails for us uh, and published a paper on that. So we do have some of those types of, of measures as well, but um, yeah. To follow, so, follow up on that. Pat, yeah, there, can you want to mention the relationship between what you know about outdoor air and indoor air? Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it depends. I guess it, it, I'd say it depends, right? So there is a relationship. It depends on um, the pollutant. So bigger pollutants and, and ozone, uh, for example, don't get indoors as well when you have the windows closed and you have central air conditioning. Um, there's also a lot of indoor sources, so um, you know, uh, of things like NO2 and, and ultrafine. So candle burning, cigarettes, um, gas stoves, uh, furnace. Anytime you burn something, um, you know, it produces uh, some of these pollutants. But there is some outdoor to indoor penetration as well, especially of the the smaller particles, uh, elemental carbon, black carbon, um, things like that. So the outdoor environment certainly influences the indoor environment, and there's indoor sources. Um, that add to it, which 
um, argue, I think, a little bit for the personal monitoring, so you can you can you can capture all of, of that. Um, whereas the the outdoor uh, models don't don't always get that. On the flip side, um, you know, the EPA doesn't regulate indoor environments, and so if we're trying to to influence regulatory action or, or think about um, outdoor levels of exposure, you know, maybe just modeling the outside environment is is um, appropriate. So. Well, I think we have pushed up to time. Um, Pat, but I thought I heard one more person have a question. Is that, did someone want to interrupt with something? Well, Dr. Lee um, has a question in the chat. Uh, could you briefly comment on how these responses are affected by exercise, presumably breathing via mouth instead of nose? Yeah, so uh, I don't know about mouth. I mean, uh, the, the mouth and the nose, um, you know, they're, they're the, the bigger particles, uh, there's some filtration mechanisms from, from breathing through the nose. Uh, mouth breathing in general is, 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 uh, gives you a higher level of inhaled dose, which is why kids, uh, we typically think kids have higher levels of, of indoor of, of, of um, inhaled doses because uh, they tend to be mouth breathers. Um, and exercise uh, you know increase, increases respiration rates so you're increasing your inhaled dose. And, um, another study that we're just getting underway with the EcoMap is um, going to measure, um, they're going to wear bio harnesses and we're going to measure respiration rates. Um, and uh, we are measuring uh, activity patterns with accelerometers and we're going to calculate inhaled doses. So um, that is to be determined. So we're just getting that one underway. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Pat. If everyone wants to unmute themselves, I don't know if we can, but we just want to thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Very impressive. You guys. Very impressive. Pat, thanks work. for the invitation. Oh, we got yeah. lots of excitement going on here. Yeah. A lot of reactions. So thanks everybody for coming and please fill out our evaluation survey. It really helps us go forward on these projects, on these wonderful seminars. And again, uh, thank you, Pat. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Right. Take care. Thanks.